of 80 Ralph. The mysteries of the unknown, UFOs, alien abductions, wonders of the world, ancient archaeology, ghosts, apparitions, secret military projects, futuristic science, government cover-ups, hoaxes and frauds. Join us as we embark on another edition of the Paranet Continuum. Now, answering questions and questioning answers, here's your host, the director of Paranet Information Services, Michael Corbin. And welcome back. Uh, 62 degrees in Denver, 106 in the morning, and of course uh, in New York where my guest Maury Terry is, it's much later. <laughs> and I uh, want to thank you, Maury, for being with us. That's at, okay. My pleasure, Michael. This, this ungodly hour. <laughs> or some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's kind of pick up where we left off. We're talking uh, again with Maury Terry. Who uh, who wrote a book? Uh, I mean, when was the book published, Maury? Hardcover, summer of '87, updated for paperback in the fall of '89. '89, and uh, the book was called "The Ultimate Evil," and it is, uh, in my opinion, it's the it's the uh, it's the concise history of a very bizarre string of murders in the New York area that stretch out, as you've been hearing, all the way to the West Coast. And uh, we're talking with Maury Terry about recent developments in the case and uh, an article that he has published in Gear Magazine. Which is available in all. I picked mine up here in Denver, and uh, it's available in all uh, major stores and, and magazine shops. And uh, Maury, let's go back to the. Uh, let's go back to New York. Let's go get back to New York after. Uh, I'm already here. Mike. Okay. <laughs> you go back to New York. Okay. Let's go to uh, talk about uh, you know how this case unfolds, uh, and uh, Berkowitz is ultimately arrested now. Originally, people thought that he uh, had basically, uh, you know, took commands from a, a dog that was demon-possessed. And uh, you have discovered, or a lot of people have discovered, the police even knew this at the time, that uh, the, whole, the whole arrest was arranged, wasn't it? I, the police didn't know at the time that the arrest was really a setup. Uh -huh. but, uh, but yes, we've come to know that it was a setup. Uh, uh, another example of... of uh, of some of the uh, vileness in the, in, the, in the manner of thinking that goes on with some of the people involved in this. I mean, Berkowitz's apartment, which which was set up to look like the lair of a madman, was indeed set up several days before his arrest. Uh, his apartment was a very normal apartment in a nice building overlooking the Hudson River about 17 miles north of Midtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the dead of night, Berkowitz, assisted by three other people, cleared out, rented a U-Haul van, cleared out his furniture, and uh, deposited it in front of a Salvation Army warehouse in a community about six miles away, left it right in front of the building. Uh, <clears throat> and then on the very day of his arrest, two other people, one of whom is, whom is named in this article for the first time, his name was John DeFrenza, uh, and along with another guy named Richie, came over and took out some last-minute stuff, Berkowitz's mail and so on and so forth, some last-minute items, and that was literally hours before the police arrived to arrest Berkowitz. Uh, Berkowitz knew the cops were on the horizon. He knew they were coming imminently, and he knew it because the night before the, uh, the arrest, um, the cops in New York City were checking a parking ticket that had been put on his car at the last Son of Sam crime scene out in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and it was a routine call to the Yonkers Police Department. They thought Berkowitz might have been a witness to it. They had no idea that Berkowitz was involved in anything, because they were looking for a yellow VW as the killer's getaway car, and Berkowitz was driving a full-size Ford Galaxy, which had been ticketed a couple of blocks from the crime scene for parking too close to a hydrant. Mm -hmm. So they're just doing a routine check of potential witnesses. And they actually, the New York City cops, actually tried to call Berkowitz at home, which I find amusing if he was home and answered. <laughs> what would he have told them, you know? <laughs> the yeah, I, you know, they did. And they, they got lazy. He didn't answer the phone, so they decided to let the Yonkers cops do their work for him. Mm -hmm. So they called Yonkers, and, 
uh, to say, why don't you, we have somebody call Berkowitz who knock on his door and ask him to give us a call. Well, lo and behold, who answers the phone at Yonkers Police Department but the daughter of Sam Carr, the sister of John Carr and Michael Carr. Her, she has the unusual name of Wheat Carr. She was a civilian dispatcher for the Yonkers PD. Mm -hmm. So here comes a New York calling up saying, yeah, would you send somebody up to ask Berkowitz to give us a call? And she goes right into her act. Berkowitz, oh, him, you know, we think he shot our dog. He's this, he's that. We think he's the son of Sam. So suddenly, potential witness Berkowitz went to the top of the list as a possible suspect. And the very next day, the New York went up and arrested him. But since the call came to, coincidentally, Wheat Carr, of course, she immediately told her brothers Berkowitz was tipped off. And... Uh, Richie and John, the friends, that go over and take out some last-minute stuff the next morning, and there's Berkowitz when the cops come out and, and arrest him outside his building that night. And, um, the, you know, uh, many people wondered why Berkowitz had this enigmatic grin on his face when he was escorted into police headquarters in front of all of the cameras. All. Right. Was now, she... I, now I know why he did. <laughs> now I know why he did. Was she involved? Did, what did she? Was she involved in this whole deal? Um... Maybe? I, I'd say that it's fair to say that she is under intense scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll take that up after the break, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll kind of come up to the present day and uh, the thing that has led to Maury's article in Gear Magazine. Maury Terry is my guest. 303-860-1280. 303-860-1280. Pound 1280 if you're a cellular AirTouch customer. We'll be right back after this. I'm Michael Corbin. This is the Paranet Continuum. Remember when it was safe to leave all your doors and windows unlocked? You know, back when you were a kid, when you didn't even need a house key because the doors were always open. Things were simpler then. Even though times have changed, it's never been simpler to protect your home and family today than with ADT, America's number one home security system. Right now, you can have ADT SafeWatch security system installed in your home for as little as $99. That's right, just $99. And once you do, you'll have the peace of mind that comes with ADT's 24-hour monitored protection and the comfort of knowing that your home is 15 times less likely to be broken into once you install an ADT system. Admit it, you've been thinking about protecting your family. Now take the next step and call ADT for their 50% off special on any additional option. Call 1-800-617-3400. That's 1-800-617-3400. Be safe. Be smart. Call 1-800-617-3400. One-time activation fee and requirements, restrictions, and fees may apply. 1280 Ralph. It's all new. It's all now. And it's all about photos and video. It's the International Camera and Camcorder Show at Robert Waxman Downtown. Representatives for over 50 camera and video manufacturers are coming together this weekend to demonstrate their newest technologies and answer all your questions. It's the greatest photo and video show on one floor in the world. And it's all at Robert Waxman downtown. Now you don't have to come downtown to get a bargain this weekend. Everything is on sale at all 15 Waxman locations, including the new digital cameras. But if you want to know the latest developments in the photo and video world, bring the whole family to the International Camera and Camcorder Show. It's fun, it's informative, it's free. And it's this Friday, Saturday and Sunday at Robert Waxman, downtown. Where your memories come first to make them Hi, this is Gus Merkus for Classic Wood. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time you saw a quality, solid wood piece of furniture? Or better yet, one you didn't have to take a second mortgage out on your home to afford? Well, there's a place, and it's right here in Denver. Classic Wood. At Classic Wood, they still use real wood and American labor. The finest pine, oak, cherry, walnut, and maple. And for that mountain look, they have the finest lodge pole and aspen furniture in the Rocky Mountain region. Also check out their antler lamps and chandeliers. They have moose chandeliers, they have elk chandeliers, they have deer chandeliers. Let Classic Wood help you find the perfect natural wood furniture for that special place you call home. They're open seven days a week for your convenience. They're just off I-25 and 58th Avenue, or you can give them a call at 295-0204. Tell them Gus sent you. Classic Wood. 
1280, Ralph. Okay, Star Child, you can put the crystals over there on the floor. However you can arrange them for maximum power would be just great. May I help you? Oh, hi. Are you a Washington Mutual loan consultant? Well, yes. Why is that woman wearing a hat shaped like a pyramid? Uh, and why is she putting huge crystals on the floor? Um, that's Mama Starchild, a soul in the eighth level of ascension. She's helping me to get you to say yes on my home loan. Please, just lie down in the circle formed by the crystals. Uh, lie down. Uh, okay. There you go. Uh, you know, at Washington Mutual, we like to say yes. See, Starchild is working already. Uh, I'm sorry, no offense, Starchild, but that has nothing to do with crystals. Oh, negativity. I think somebody needs the pyramid hat. It's just that we offer so many different loan options, we can find one to work for your individual needs. Really? Really. <laughs> it's the crystals, huh? At Washington Mutual, we make home loans happen for you by looking at each individual on a case-by-case -case basis. Call 1-888-WAMU-LEN for the loan consultant nearest you. Home loans from Washington Mutual. The power of yes. Certain restrictions apply in equal housing lender. We'll clear up that itchy rash. 1280 Ralph. Three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty is our number. My guest is Maury Terry, and uh, we're talking about the infamous Son of Sam case and uh, something that occurred back in the late seventies, middle seventies, late seventies uh, in New York. And uh, it's an incredible story. And of course, uh, Maury Terry has been on it and uh, developing quite a bit of material over the years. And um, Maury, let's talk about the, uh, the the stuff that's developed since Berkowitz was convicted and has been in prison, uh, you've developed quite a bit of wild information that uh, kind of leads, like you mentioned earlier, to a very to very high places. Yeah, I, I mean, when I did The Ultimate Evil, um, information alluding to the upper levels of society, mm -hmm. um, there, was, there was information in the book about that in the late, in the late 80s. And but it but it wasn't specific information because I didn't have specific information. I was dealing through a couple of, a handful of prison informants <clears throat> who had gotten close to Berkowitz and he told them certain things. And um, but since I've been able to sit down with Berkowitz, which started in 1993, mm -hmm. um, a lot of other very specific information has has been developed as to who these people were. Other informants have come forward. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy who was involved with the process uh, who's in prison in the South today. I, he's mentioned in that article. His name is Jesse Turner. Jesse Turner provided very, very specific information about the process and their hooks into the upper levels of society, both in New York and what they were doing in New Orleans, which is where Turner spent almost two years with them and he later hooked up with them again in New York. Mm -hmm. So between the various sources of information over the last few years, very specific evidence has been developed pointing to exactly how this whole setup worked and how they were able to get away with it and what types of people were involved on the upper levels. And um, there were two aides to New York City's mayor at the time, Abraham Beam. Mm -hmm. There were uh, there was a, a then Yonkers judge. There were a couple of Westchester County, which is where Yonkers is, the, the county just north of New York City, politicians, and there were a couple of New York State level politicians involved with this group. And by that, I want to emphasize, I don't mean that they were sitting down planning the murders with them, but they were in the social circles with this group. They were at sex parties together. Mm. The people I'm alluding to had a thing for young kids, and young kids were provided at these parties. God. And, and uh, when Berkowitz got arrested, you can see why people like this would be scurrying around and using their old boy network behind the scenes to make sure the case wasn't pursued further, mm -hmm. because it would lead right into their twisted into their twisted lives. Um, I was shocked at how high up it went. I'm not shocked that top-level officials are, some of them, are into young kids. That doesn't shock me. Mm -hmm. But it just shocked me that it was so 
in this case and how wide the net was 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 spread in order to keep the lid of mixing metaphors on on the case right right the, the thing that that appalls me and uh, I, I I don't know if you know Senator John DeCamp but uh, I'm certainly familiar with the case uh, I read I read a book that came out about that uh, it was and called so the, on and so forth. It was called the Franklin Cover. Yes, out of uh, Nebraska, right? I inter that's right. I interviewed the gentleman well, a couple of months ago on my program, and it, it just was, it, number one, it was sickening. I mean, it, it just it, to me, uh, you know, you say you're not surprised, but, of course, after the investigation <laughs> investigation that you've been involved in, I, you know, I, I understand. But, you know, I just, it just, it just blew me away to, to hear of the kind of stuff that, that was going on. But, you know, the thing I wonder is how does this kind of thing happen? And how do people at these levels get involved in something as heinous and horrific as this? I, you know, there's the uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders song from 1966, which I always thought says so much. And the name of the song was Kicks, and it was Kicks Just Keep Getting Harder to Find. Mm -hmm. And I think some of these people, when they have the money, when they have the power, they've done everything. And they keep looking for the next thrill. What will turn me on next? And, and some of them, it eventually leads into, into sex with kids and snuff films and so on and so forth. Good heavens. Because they have done everything else. I mean, there was a snuff film, and I put Berkowitz on TV, uh, confirming this, made of The Last Son of Sam, uh, showed it. Right, I remember seeing that on the... Uh, the art. Right, they made a damn movie of it. And they were selling it. Uh, it's a real collector's item. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things like you hear about valuable pieces of artwork being mm -hmm. stolen. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't exactly advertise in magazines saying, buy this, but there are collectors who will pay a fortune just to have a stolen piece of valuable stolen piece of art, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it was this way, as I understand it, with the Son of Sam snuff film, that there were a handful of copies made and, um, and that they went for an awful lot of money. One of the, one of the names that came up in the, uh, the A&E piece that you're referring to was, uh, Robert Mapplethorpe. Yeah, Robert Mapplethorpe. Um, again, a friend of uh, this individual named Jesse Turner, who's presently in jail for bank robbery, who mm -hmm. I mentioned a few minutes ago. Turner and Mapplethorpe had known each other very well. Turner actually lived with Mapplethorpe when Mapplethorpe, in the early 70s, was, uh, was dating and living with uh, Patti Smith, the, right. the well-known rock singer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Turner was living with them in another bedroom in the apartment. Maplethorpe was mostly gay, mm -hmm. but whatever he did with Patty Smith, I don't know. But he that's why, and Maplethorpe was involved with the process. And Maplethorpe, is, is, if people are familiar with him, may know, was one of the real kings of kink. I mean, his photography and, and his artwork and all was homoerotic to the nth degree mm -hmm. and scandalous to the, to the minds of many, many people. And there was a big furor, I believe, in the late 80s, when the National Endowment for the Arts uh, funded um, a display of his work, or, uh, an exhibit of his work in Cincinnati, and there was all sorts of repercussions because right. it was called just outrageous stuff. Uh, but Turner had been involved with process, and so was Maplethorpe. <clears throat> and when they wanted this Son of Sam movie back, the word was passed through Maplethorpe, can you, can you find somebody who will go get this film back from the guy who's, who's got a copy of it? And um, Turner said to Maplethorpe, sure. And he recruited two guys who went into this brownstone in Manhattan on Halloween of 81 and, and uh, got, it, got the film um, and killed the guy, Ronald Sisman, his name was, along with a young college co-ed who was in Sisman's brownstone at the time, mm -hmm. and took off with the film. And according to Turner, um, that film and, and four others were then sent to Maplethorpe's post office box in Lower New York City by the, uh, by the gunman who did it. Now, two years ago, just two years ago, the New York City cops hauled in these two alleged gunmen mm -hmm. who were named by Turner. One of them blew the needle off the poly machine. He was lying so badly. And the other was caught four times trying to beat the machine. The two of them then hired lawyers. And that case right now is at a stalemate. Mm -hmm. The, there were detectives in the NYPD who wanted to keep going with this, one, but when the top of the department learned that this was leading right into the Son of Sam case, they put the lid on it. Wow. Now, and, and, of course, this is, uh, was this referred to in the, uh, in the video piece? That, was this referring to the part where the uh, 
the NYPD had opened the investigation. And That's exactly what it was. And Ronald Sisman, who was murdered there in his brownstone uh, in 81, along with the co-ed, mm -hmm. Sisman was actually the guy in the van at the last Son of Sam scene who was running the camera. Mm. They had a van parked across the street. There were three people in it. I know the identities of all three. Sisman was one of them. Mm -hmm. And Sisman, they whacked to get the film back, in, uh, his copy of the film back in 81. One of the other people in the van was a very close associate of somebody you mentioned earlier in this program, uh, of a named Roy Radin, who was right. uh, uh, another kinky guy with a ton of money from Southampton, Long Island, who was trying to enter the movie business as a producer and was murdered over the film The Cotton Club in Los Angeles, outside of L.A., in 1983. And the third person in the van was, well, okay, I'll leave the, the third person out of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the, the thing is, is that when your investigation has taken you, as you mentioned, uh, Roy Radin, for example. Uh, I'll tell you something about Roy Radin. The person who, <laughs> one of the people involved in Radin's murder was also a shooter in the Son of Sam case. Now, is that the, the guy that's now in prison that was dubbed Manson too? That's correct. Uh, I don't recall his name now. Um, well, I haven't released the whole thing publicly, but I will before too long, I think. Okay. Uh, I know Sanders mentioned some of this stuff in his book uh, when he was talking about the family of Manson and all that. Let me ask you this. I, I know that Manson was involved in uh, producing um, f films of that nature. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, the, the one question that comes up into my mind that I've, I've wanted to ask a, a person like yourself who's really been deeply involved in the investigation of this stuff. Sanders alluded to the idea that there might have been some kind of intelligence community involvement in some of this activity. Have you run across anything like Ed that in Sanders your... Sanders mentioned that to me, too. Um, and uh, let me respond to it this way. I think it was a fair thing for Ed Sanders to wonder about. Mm -hmm. I have wondered about it, too. Uh, I'm not saying it's so. Right. The reason I have wondered about it is because I cannot understand how an organization like the process was allowed to enter this country and still exists in this country. I mean, Vince Bugliosi pointed the finger at them in Helter Skelter. Mm -hmm. Sanders did it in the family. I did it in The Ultimate Evil and on television and elsewhere. And that the fact that these people have not been arrested and or deported is beyond belief. It almost makes me... I mean, I know the FBI is very capable of falling asleep at the wheel. I've seen it enough. <laughs> uh, and INS sometimes is a joke. Uh -huh. you know, it's a big bureaucracy. But it's not as if people haven't been pointing fingers at process. They have. Why are they still in existence? Why are they operating in America stronger today than ever? That's I mean, they have amassed a fortune. In, in, and in a lot of it is now in real estate and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I could say this, the original core, with one or two exceptions, of process leaders who came to America in 1967 are still together today. Wow. All together, and they're a lot closer to where you're sitting than where I'm sitting. Oh, God. <laughs> I, God I, <laughs> that's not good to hear. No, it's, a, it's, a fa it's an absolute fact. An absolute fact. Oh, boy. Well, let's take a break, and when we come back, uh, we'll, we'll uh, pursue even more of this. And uh, very, very interesting. Murray, I want to thank you again you know, for being on the program. This is uh, very My fascinating pleasure. stuff. My pleasure. It's good talking to you. 303-860-1280. 303-860-1280. My guest is Maury Terry. Stay tuned. There's a lot more to come on the Parenting Continuum. We'll be right back. Thinking of selling or even junking your old car, RV, or boat? Why not donate it to Mountain State Children's Home? For over 37 years, Mountain State Children's Home has cared for victims of child abuse and neglect. Your donation is tax deductible. Current registration is not required. Free towing is available and no smog certificate is required. 
call 1-800-513-6560 before the tax year ends. Your unwanted car, RV, or boat is tax deductible and makes a difference for children right here in Colorado. Thank you for your support. That toll-free number for donations is 1-800-513-6560. That's 1-800-513-6560. 1-80-RALPH. Going places? Discount airfare? You bet. Travel now. Colorado's number one airline ticket discount broker brings you the lowest airfares nationwide. Check out these prices. Denver, Seattle, round trip $259. New York, $269. Atlanta, $315. New Orleans, $299. Boston, $339. Orlando, Tampa, $329. Chicago, $199. Phoenix, $258. Washington, D.C., $289 and more. When your airfare seems unfair, call Travel Now. 303-799-3424. That's 303-799-3424. Shop and compare. Prices are on the rise, and Colorado's number one airline ticket discount broker will save you money on your next airline ticket. Call today or keep the number handy. 303-799-3424. 303-799-3424. Discount airfare to Austin, Boston, Charlotte, Bangor, Maine, Louisville, Portland, Orlando, Tampa, Richmond, Houston, Dallas, Madison, Springfield, Chattanooga, Washington, D.C., Birmingham, Jackson, Syracuse. Mike Naughton is Ford. Hi, I'm Mike Naughton. Are you looking for a great, reliable used car for under 5000 Believe me, a lot of people are. That's why you better hurry to my 50 under 5000 used car sale Friday and Saturday. 50 great used cars and trucks, all clearance priced under 5000 They're emission, reconditioned, and ready for delivery. So if you're looking for an incredible bargain on a car, truck, or van, this is the sale you won't want to miss. With approved credit, just $59 down delivers. Bargain hunters, Friday and Saturday will make 50 lucky used car buyers very happy. It's in Aurora at Havana and Alameda. 50 great used cars that could sell for twice the price will go for under $5,000 or less. My 50 and under used car sale Friday and Saturday at Mike Naughton Ford. In Colorado, Big Mike Naughton is Ford. Big Mike Naughton is Ford. 1280 Ralph. The federal government mandates that every automobile must pass eight different crash tests before it's deemed safe enough for you to drive. Saab mandates that both the 95 and 93 must pass 40 different crash tests before they're safe enough for you to drive. The law says eight. Saab says 40. That's 32 additional tests to help drivers feel safe and confident when they take our cars out on the road. Nothing against the federal government. But sometimes more is better. Lisa 1999 Saab 95 with five speed manual transmission for only $399 a month. 39 month lease requires $2,647.43, including security deposit at lease inception. Total monthly payments equal $15,538.77. Lease program expires October 31, 1998. For details on this or other finance options, call 1 800 Saab USA. Visit Mike Shaw Saab and test drive a new Saab today. Your home at work, 1280 Ralph. Three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty. Three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty. We're going into the night with uh, Maury Terry, and we're talking about David Berkowitz, son of Sam, a very very bizarre murder case. And of course, as you've been hearing. David Berkowitz did not act alone. There was a conspiracy. And then as we're being told by Maury Terry, there, it involves very high-level people. And uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that I'd like to say, Michael. Um, you know, just before the break, we were theorizing or speculating a bit on the possibility of some intelligence community connection somewhere into this process right. organization. That's speculation. What isn't speculation is that there, in fact, was a big conspiracy in the Son of Sam case that reached into high places. Mm -hmm. That's been corroborated. There are, uh, there are witnesses. There are supporting data. That's beyond theory. That That's part fact. is absolute fact. Uh -huh. Berkowitz has made statements, and they have been corroborated left and right, from crime scene evidence, through events in his life, through people in his life, through the activities of other when we talked before about how his apartment was, they took the furniture out of his apartment, all that's been corroborated, everything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't come on your air blowing smoke about 
about things unless I knew that, them to be so. And if it is a theory, I'll label it as a theory. Yeah. What um, What was the, the victims that uh, felt that were to this to this thing? Were they random? How many of them were random, or were they not random? Well, that's another thing, and I'm glad you brought that point up because, to me, to my mind, and this has not gotten enough publicity, uh, this is one of the critical factors in the case. I mean, at the time, <laughs> it was believed that all the Son of Sam killings were done by a random psychopath. Well, psychos don't have legitimate motives for doing what they're doing. Right. They're supposedly crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, there is extremely strong evidence, and Berkowitz has has confirmed that it's so, that at least two of the Son of Sam victims, two out of the eight attacks, were not random at all, but were hits, what were target hits, mm -hmm. that they were, they were deliberately after the victims by itself. That blows out the entire perception of what the public the believed the Son of Sam case to be. Right. Did, did these people, the two out of the eight... As I understand it, and I, I think I read this in your book. As I understand it, that the the, uh, the, the random ones were the, they were done that way to basically throw people off of the trail of a of a deliberate hit or yeah, an assassination. First, right. In a way, the first Son of Sam shooting was a hit against a girl in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Then you know they were on this campaign of terror anyway, mm -hmm. and so the whole thing served a couple of purposes, and they were able to sneak a couple of hits into a string of otherwise random attacks, random as to the rest of the victims, but not random as to location. All these locations were carefully scouted for the best chance of doing something and getting away with it and so on and so forth. But mm. certain, two of the victims were hits. The first one was a hit uh, because she lived in an area in the Bronx and she where she came in contact with some members of this cult. She also went to a nightclub uh, in nearby that was frequented by cult members the point being that she heard about what they were up to and the kinds of things they were planning and she had a big mouth and she was killed for that reason Gosh. one of the others midway in the string was a basically a contract hit they took a contract to eliminate somebody over some convoluted lovers triangle good heavens the hell of a thing to and kill then the last ever. one they made a movie out of at the behest of roy raiden jeez now, I, in your article in Gear Magazine, um, you mentioned that the, the new investigation was opened in the spring of '96, which was spurred by the death of a prominent New York businessman and a handful of portraits that were sketched 20 years earlier. Uh, and, and of course, this was also featured in the A and E piece. Tell us a little bit about that. I know that you're not going to release the name of the businessman, but what was surrounding that? I, I, I again, you know, th there's chilling parts of this article. Uh, we, yeah, we had information about one of the top leaders of this group who, who resided in Westchester County, mm -hmm. including his profession, which was real estate, yeah. and generally where he lived and so on and so on. Well, by 1995, I had the name mm -hmm. of who he was, and then I just happened to catch a death notice in the paper in 1996 mm -hmm. that this person had died. Uh, the police were alerted immediately, and um, they had had a sketch that, that had been provided to them by this young guy who was a budding artist back in 1976, 20 years before. Right. And he hung out for, for several weeks that summer, just before the Son of Sam murders began, in a, um, in a wooded park, big wooded park, former estate in Yonkers, just near Berkowitz, where Berkowitz was living, with some of this cult group. He didn't know who they were, what they were up to or that they were about to start on a murder campaign, and they tried to recruit him. Is this that Untermeyer Park? That's right. And, and this young budding artist would hang out with them for a while, and then he'd go home and sketch. And he sketched four or five of the people up there. Mm -hmm. And he sketched somebody. One of them happened, as it turned out, happened to be the leader of this group. And uh, this kid didn't know that then. But the sketches were, in, in the 90s, turned over to the cops. Mm -hmm. And so when I noticed the obit, this guy had died, you know, the cops went up and went in to the wake and off the sketch I did the guy. And they called me and told me, it's him. And I said, well, you guys weren't the ones who saw him in Untermeyer Park. Let me find the artist. So I found the artist, and they went and picked him up and took him up to the wake and walked him in. And he said, what am I, do what am I supposed to do? They, they just said, just go in and see if you recognize the guy lying in the box. And he comes back out of the funeral home and said, it's him. How the hell did you know it was him? How would you know? And, of course, they wouldn't tell him. But a remarkable story. 
But he went by the name of Moloch? Or... That was his uh, so-called occult name, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And, 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 in real life, he was uh, in his 70s at the time of his death, yeah. and he was uh, a wealthy real estate guy who had done uh, consulting work for the state of New York, and et cetera, et cetera. Wow. <laughs> God. What is and the... the reason I can't name him is because he has a couple of relatives who are also strong suspects. Otherwise, I would tell you his name right now. Yeah. What um, what was about the Untermeyer Park though? I mean, there was the in the A and E piece they showed the uh, there's there's like a gazebo or something like yes. that. Yeah, yeah. Untermeyer, um, boy, uh, the Untermeyer estate uh, goes back many years. It was originally owned by Samuel Tilden, who ran for U.S. president in 1876 against Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh-huh. And in 1903, it came into the hands of a wealthy lawyer named Samuel Untermeyer. And Untermeyer uh, was very much into the occult himself. Uh, today in the park, the remnants of, of, of his uh, uh, statuary and all are still there, and it show, very clearly shows his fascination with the occult. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, the war, and he imported statuary and everything from England, you know. And when Untermeyer died in 1940, the place went into disrepair and so on and so forth. And, of course, the legend about it grew, that it was sacred ground to those in, in the occult because they knew about Samuel Untermeyer and his affinity for it and so on and so forth. So there was and, a lot of activity there. Yes, and it was, you know, central casting couldn't have put up a better place for, for cult rituals to occur. It's, Gives me uh, the creeps, and I've never seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's, you know, like 25 or 30 acres or something uh-huh. heavily wooded with all these old monuments and statues and everything like that. Again, just picture something Hollywood do, would do, and you'd say... This couldn't exist in real life, but guess what? It's not. <laughs> oh, God. What, what kind of a man is Berkowitz? Um, he's, any, he's totally unlike the public perception of him at the time, although he's the first one to admit that he was out of it then. He's, he, to this minute, he can't understand how he, how he got so crazy involved in this stuff. Mm-hmm. He, he has a tremendous amount of, of remorse, he's a, uh, and he really doesn't think he deserves to get out of jail. Um, you know, a lot of these guys are saying, get me out of here, get me out of here. Berkowitz thinks he belongs there. Mm-hmm. You know, he said, I did kill a couple of these people. I did do some of the shootings, not all of them, and I was involved in all of it as a conspirator. He's very open about it, so he's not trying to get out of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I said, he's very intelligent. He has an excellent sense of humor. And if you had ever met David Berkowitz in a bar or something and started talking sports with him, you wouldn't have any idea. Really? Uh who he was or what he had been involved with. That's the kind of person he is. Now. now, in your book, you mentioned when he first went into prison, he was very reticent about talking, uh, and there was something about mentioned about his father. Why is he talking now? Because his father, one of the reasons, there are two main reasons. One is that his father is now, uh, what is he, 88? Uh and he's lived a good long life, and he's been safe. Mm -hmm. And number two, probably a bigger reason than that, is that in the late 80s, Berkowitz became a born-again Christian. And he feels an obligation, Mm -hmm. because of his religion, to say as much as he feels safe in saying about this. I mean, getting him to a courtroom is another matter. I don't know if that would ever happen. Um, But... He has felt obligated to make some statements about it, and things that he said that I put on television were extremely important and very helpful and very concise. Is he? I guess the question, I guess, is is that is the threat is 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 the threat still as potent as it was before, or is he just because of his conviction, his his conversion to being Christian? It, it outweighs his fear of what could happen to him if he talks. I think it's there's still a battle. I, I know there's still a battle going on inside of him. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, part of him wants to be extremely helpful, but there's the other part. You know, he's been in prison a long time, and there's the jailhouse code. You don't want to. You know, you don't want to. You're not supposed to be a snitch. Right. Uh, so he's he's torn between the two things, and I think he has come up with a compromise in his own mind. Whereas he will, he is, he had agreed to say enough to corroborate things and to uh, let the investigation move forward. But he, you know, there's a certain line that he doesn't want to cross. Right, right. 
How has this affected you? I mean, you put a lot of years into this. I've done a lot of other things, too, thankfully. I, I mean, from 88 to 93, I was basically had nothing to do with the investigation. Uh, mm -hmm. It had ceased. Uh, I was doing other things, other cases, moving on and doing a lot of television and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then in the, even in 93, I did a big thing with Berkowitz when he first spoke on television. Mm -hmm. And then I got involved in the Simpson case, the O.J. case, and uh, then came back to Son of Sam after the Simpson case. So, um, in other words, I haven't had to live it 24 hours a day for all these years. I've certainly had extended periods of time when I've been away from it and doing other things. You, I found mm -hmm. that you can't let something like this take you over or you can just, be, you know, get swallowed up by it. Has this changed you in any way? I think it's made me much more cynical because I now have <laughs> yeah. virtually no trust in the powers that be. I see the lies that are told every day mm -hmm. uh, and I see how cover-ups work and, uh, and I had, don't have a lot of respect for law enforcement in general. Lord knows there are a lot of great cops out there and a lot of great detectives, but there are a lot of there's a lot of real incompetence in law enforcement also. And once you get to the higher levels of it, where it becomes political, yeah, uh, where where police officials and all are playing games with city hall and and so on and so forth, and where it's it's the uh, CYA, um, you know, cover your whatever uh, attitude takes over. I, I think there's a great disservice being done to the public in many, many jurisdictions throughout this country. I'm curious, you know, when you're talking about this kind of, when you talk about this kind of stuff, uh, do you feel that a lot of this stuff is leading us somewhere and, and that, you know, the process, for example, was just one of those stepping stones to something much bigger or something much more sinister? Or, or do you think that, you know, this is just the way it plays out? I don't know how much more sinister than, than one can get than the process is all by itself. Mm -hmm. What I don't know, and I don't know if I'll ever know, and frankly, I don't know if I want to know, is if some of these things we've talked about, what could be above them. I, you know, whether that's whether there's something above them or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. One would suspect there is, only because, as I said before, how in God's name are they allowed to exist for so long? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, that's a very good question. You know, is law enforcement that incompetent, or do they have friends in high places? Well, I know they have friends in high places, mm -hmm. but do they have friends in places high enough to make sure that nobody bothers them? You know, are they a, is what Sanders speculated true? Could they perhaps be in a, uh, in a rogue intelligence operation gone awry at some point, and, and, and rather than expect expose that and all of the repercussions that would come from that that people uh, in high places look the other way I just I just don't know yeah I mean I'm you know I've had to work from the bottom up on this and I think we've gotten pretty high with it you know yeah and I wish the FBI would get off its you know posterior posterior <laughs> right and and go out and mount a real investigation into this you know yeah although they're probably too busy trying to figure out who killed John Benet Ramsey <laughs> Do we see any evidence in our in our culture today? Do we see any evidence of uh, of this activity, like in murders that occur, um, you know, things that we hear in the news? Is there anything that you see there that is connected to this? That I can't really say uh, at this point because, uh, you know, there are people keeping an eye on what the process is doing. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, the the 60s are over with, the 70s are over with. They don't go around with the black capes anymore. Yeah. They've abandoned the satanic They're in suit stuff and tie. entirely. They're on the Internet. They're doing things very sophisticated. Yeah. Okay, Maury, we're going to take another break. We'll be back in just a moment with that. 303-860-1280. 303-860-1280. Pound 1280 if you're a cellular air touch caller. We'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. I'm Michael Corbin. This is the Paranet Continuum. It all begins with Imus in the morning. Money was not a decision. I mean, it was not a factor. I mean, I have everything right now. I have a car. <laughs> you got it going on, yo. You know, it's just <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's beyond got, sad. He's got, got everything he needs. It's beyond idiotic and sad. But it doesn't make any difference. I, I got, got the automatic windows, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, I'm a player, yo. <laughs> We're fine. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. I'll be beating the bitches off my back. <laughs> Mornings from 4 to 10. On Denver's Talk Alternative. 1280 Ralph. My name is Sandy Pichananda. 
The waves are my highways. Sea turtles my convertibles. The smooth backs of dolphins my minivans. Okay, but the rest of us have to drive real cars, so why not call GEICO Direct? One call could save you 15% or more on car insurance, even if your car has fins. Call 1-800-947-AUTO. That's 1-800-947-AUTO. GEICO Direct, the sensible alternative. 1280 Ralph. Hot flashes, mood swings, constant tension, menopause. If you're in your menopausal years, I can help. I'm Ann Louise Gittleman, nutritionist and author of Super Nutrition for Menopause and Before the Change. For menopausal comfort and healthy bones, I strongly recommend Rejuvex. Since 1991, estrogen-free Rejuvex has helped hundreds of thousands of women pass through the menopausal years in comfort. Rejuvex is a combination of vitamins, minerals, and the popular herb Don Quai. If you're over 40, take comfort in Rejuvex. It works. Van Smack is in the jungle on 1280 Ralph. In a lot of ways, Mike would probably say, man, that was a hard experience, but it was a good experience. The guy went down to New York, and he's putting up numbers in a pen and stretch. And if you can do that, there's nothing you can't do. I mean, I will say that about New York. It's a hard town, and when you win, the fans are great, and when you don't, they're brutal. But that kind of goes back to the old saying, and it's trite, but it's true. If you can thrive and succeed there, you can't anywhere. It's a hard town. Real sports talk with Jim Rome and the jungle. Middays from 10 to 2. On Denver's Talk Alternative. 1280 Ralph. I'm so frustrated. Mortgage rates are the lowest they've been in 25 years, and we can't refinance because of credit problems. If this sounds like you, see Spectrum Financial. They're truly different from other mortgage companies. What makes them different? Spectrum Financial has people who know they are retained by you to do a job. Refinancing can be done in as little as seven days, including appraisal. That's right, seven days. Spectrum Financial understands that refinancing can be a hassle, and the refinancing experts will do whatever necessary to make the paperwork as painless as possible, including coming to you. If Spectrum Financial can't get you financed, probably no one can. Even though our credit wasn't great, my refinance was easy thanks to Spectrum Financial. Call Spectrum Financial at 303-273-0000. That's 303-273-0000. Spectrum Financial. It's a guy, you're on the air. Yeah, I'm at a pet store. No, looking for a furry friend? Well, not exactly. They have a deal on wireless phones, but you have to buy a ferret. Got a question about phones or ferrets? Well, this pet guy doesn't know wireless. Go to Radio Shack. They're the experts. Can they beat this ferret deal? How about $50 cash back by mail on select Nokia phones? Wow, 50 bucks? Uh, yeah, they'll help you choose the right service plan, too. Well, I kind of like the ferret, but ouch! Hope you've had your shots. Radio Shack. You've got questions, we've got answers. See store for details. The original aviators had a cup of coffee at dawn, put in a full day in the air, and accomplished their mission. Sound familiar? At TWA, we recognize that same determined spirit in you, today's business traveler, today's aviator. We've even named our frequent flyer program after you, Aviators, offering more rewards and more respect for your time in the air. It's just one of the ways we recognize you, today's aviators. We're TWA, and we want to be your airline. Four out of five doctors agree. 1280 Ralph. Three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty. Three zero three eight six zero twelve eighty. Maury Terry is my guest, and we're talking about the Son of Sam case. I, uh, Maury, <clears throat> um, where's all this going to go? I mean, are you are you hopeful that in a short time? I mean, are we just kind of like? Uh, you know, kind of pointing to the wind with all of this. Do you think every, anything is ever going to come down and get resolved on this? I would, <clears throat> in a sense, it has been resolved, Michael. I mean, we now know what the truth is. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I can't convene a grand jury. I, I, right. I don't have a badge, a gun, or subpoena power. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you ought to, really, yeah, because you've done I a hell of a job I, with this. Sometimes I wish I could. <laughs> but, you know, I feel that I, I, it's to a point where I've, basically taken it almost as far as I can take it. Mm -hmm. It's been served up now on a silver platter. And the the recent investigation by Yonkers, which lasted two years, Yonkers is a big city. It's the fourth largest city in New York State. We're not talking about a, the, you know, some podunk police department here. We're, the, we're talking about a, a police department that has over 500 people on it. So it was a, a big city investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, they've come up with the same thing I've been saying for years. And what the Queens DA in New York uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s came up with also, there was, in fact, a conspiracy in this case. So 
I think it should be federal. I think this was interstate. I, it absolutely was interstate conspiracy to commit murder. Um, and there's an ongoing criminal enterprise here. And I believe it calls for federal intervention because only the feds have the jurisdiction, really, the, the budgets, et cetera, mm -hmm. the, who, can, who can cast the net across the various states where this whole thing has been operating and continues to operate today. As I said earlier, with a couple of exceptions, the original core of process, and that's over a dozen, the leaders of this whole thing are still together mm. in the same place. How, how much do you think Berkowitz has withheld up to this point? Not a lot. So there's a, he's actually pretty much told it all. Well, as far as he can go, considering the environment he's in, I mean, he has certainly provided enough leads uh, where things were able to go out and be investigated and be corroborated. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be enough? Um, and there have been other informants, other sources, other participants or fringe people, people like Jesse Turner, who we talked about before, right. who have been able to provide names and so on and so forth. I... It's, it's absolutely safe to say now that the identity of all the Son of Sam shooters is known, the identities of those who assisted at crime scenes is known, the identities of the people who ordered this thing, who set it up, are known. Mm -hmm. And we have a pretty good handle on the, the reaches into the upper levels that this thing had and how that was accomplished through processes of ability to, to reach out for people and provide them with kids and all and get them into, into the web uh, and make them vulnerable because of their um, their sexual perversions. Jeez, are, are, do you do you foresee a book, another book, for you? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they. I know the ultimate evil. I I have reason to believe through conversations with publishers that the ultimate evil is probably going to be released again next summer. Whether or not there will be another book is hard to say. That depends on the publishing world. I mean, it might be at the stage now where some where publishers would say, well. You know, only if there are indictments. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I just don't know. Uh, I mean, at some point, I would like to do another book because I think the case calls for one. Yeah. Whether or not that will be so, I don't know, or whether I'll just do some more television on it, I, I just don't know. Wow. Well, it's an incredible story, Maury, and I want to thank you uh, for for you know being on the program with us, talking about this uh, this article in Gear Magazine. Fascinating stuff. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. All right. We'll, we'll stay in touch. I'm, I'm sure if anything else develops, we can talk to you again. Absolutely so. Okay. Maury, thank you very much. That was Maury Terry. And again, uh, he uh, published a book in the late 80s called The Ultimate Evil. And as you just heard, uh, that book may be re-released uh, by the publisher. And uh, if you're at all inclined to do so, you might want to get uh, Gear Magazine and check out the article. It's very, uh, very interesting. It gives you up-to-the-date up stuff if you were following that uh, Son of Sam case like I was. Uh, it's very interesting. Okay, stay tuned. We've got uh, a couple of more hours. Uh, we're going to do open lines and uh, talk about whatever's on your mind. Uh, the number again is 303-860-1280. 303-860-1280. Pound 1280 if you're a cellular air touch caller. And uh, we'll be back after the network news. So stay tuned. I'm Michael Corbin. This is the Paranet Continuum. Denver. Expect the unexpected from Denver's Talk Alternative, 1280 Route.